Hello, I think this is like the first actual video of the new year. Um, and it's going to be a reading vlog. Every year around MLK Day, I do a vlog, but I'm going to go ahead and do one a week before MLK Day. It's January 5th, um, to keep my mind off the fact that tomorrow is January 6th. And if you can't tell by my accent, I am American. Um, so I'm going to read The Da Vinci Code for the first time. You can kind of see it there. Um, full disclosure. This is not going to be a totally authentic vlog because I have seen the movie and I do already know the answers to all the puzzles. But the reason I'm reading this is because when I was in college, my professor, Miro Pinkov, was a very, very pessimistic man. I love the guy. I still talk to him. He's a great guy. Um, to be quite honest, I haven't read his writing. <laughs> but... Um, He's a great teacher, nonetheless. Um, he hated Dan Brown. He would go on rants about how there's no money in literary fiction. Why are people like Dan Brown selling? He can't even put a sentence together. Like, he did not like Dan Brown. <laughs> I haven't read really anything by Dan Brown. I did start reading The Last Symbol when I was in high school. I don't recall the writing being bad. I don't really recall anything about it. I didn't finish it. So I'm going to spend this weekend reading The Da Vinci Code. If the writing is as bad as my teacher said it was, it probably won't take me long to get through it. Um, so yeah. So let's see what all the fuss is about. And also, full disclosure, I hate the Catholic Church. <laughs> so there's that too. So this pissed off the Catholic Church. Um, so maybe it'll make me happy. Roll that intro. I, uh, I just read the prologue, and the movie <laughs> took basically the prologue straight out of the book um, with that first scene, so that was pretty cool. But can Dan Brown put a sentence together? <laughs> Not really. His prose is pretty bad. Here's the first paragraph. Renowned curator Jacques Saunier staggered through the vaulted archway of the museum's grand gallery. He lunged for the nearest painting he could see. Wow, that's bad. A cock Italian name. <laughs> Grabbing the gilded frame. We know how I feel like... <laughs> feel about starting with improper gerundic phrases. Grabbing the gilded frame, the 76-year-old man heaved the masterpiece towards himself until it tore from the wall and Sonier collapsed backward in a heap beneath the canvas. Wow, that was bad. Yeah, the prose is awful. Um, I do like the ambiance. I think it's unique that it takes place at the Louvre, and I can totally see why this was a hit so far. It's mystical, it's violent. It starts out with an old man getting shot in the stomach by an albino assassin. Um, that's pretty cool. So I actually like this, despite the really, really bad prose. Um, and to add to the ambiance, this is what I'm listening to. <laughs> yeah, it's a Gregorian chant. It's kind of creepy. So um, yeah, sorry, Miro. I like it. page 85 of the da vinci code um which i think i mean it's chapter 12 and i think it's like still within the first like 15 minutes of the movie um it keeps like jumping around um between different points of view and different people and giving us some backstories and yes the prose is crappy but i don't i can't say whether or not dan brown meant for us to take it seriously in a way, I think it kind of did. I think this lacks a little bit of self-awareness in a way because it is so overtly feminine. It, he keeps talking about Da Vinci, how Da Vinci was a flaming homosexual, his words not mine, how it, there was pagan like nature worship 
and how they worshipped feminine, the equality, the balance with men. And our main antagonist so far is a French policeman who's, I mean, sexist is not even the right word. Like, he hates women. It goes beyond sexism, beyond misogyny. This guy really hates women. Um, He's not a lot of depth to him. Makes him really easy to hate. He's overpowered by Sophie, who is a cryptologist, who says he cracked, she cracked the code. And yes, it's bad. It's pulpy. Do I think it was intended to be pulp? Not really, honestly. I think Dan Brown wants us to take it seriously. But I just can't. But I'm really enjoying it. And the way it leaves off at cliffhangers, at really, really um, short chapters, it just sucks you in. So I'm hungry. I'm going to go get dinner from Chipotle. Then I will come back and read. I'll be quite honest, I didn't wake up till 2 o'clock this, mor- this afternoon. Um, so my sleep schedule is really, really off. And it's about 8 p.m. at night. I honestly think I'm just going to stay up until I finish the book. Whether that be like 6 in the morning, 8 in the morning. I don't know. I need to get my circadian rhythm back on track because I have to go back to work Monday. Even though I don't see students again until Tuesday. So this may be a 24-hour reading vlog. We'll see, but I'm flying through this. This is, this is fun. Symbols are a language that can help us understand our past. As the saying goes, a picture says a thousand words. So this is my uh, current reading position. <laughs> um, but uh, there's something kind of interesting I want to read. Um, Silas, our albino assassin, um, has a 13-round heckler and cock USP-40. That's a gun. And he's going into a church and he decides to leave it in the car because a weapon of death has no place in the house of God. He's a Christian. Does he forget (laughs) what the cross is? That's a torture device that killed people. 15, chapter 19. And one thing I recall when the movie came out was that people were very, very... I don't know if you can hear the background. That's my guinea pigs. People were very, very critical about it, saying it was terribly done and definitely not as good as the book. But my whole life, I had kind of figured that the book wasn't that great either. And it's not. It's not good. Um, But I like it. And one thing I like a whole lot about it is Sophie. Um, The main female character, Robert Langdon, thinks she's nuts. She comes in with these crazy ideas. And he's like, whoa, lady, just chill out for a second. But she's got spunk. She's smart. And in the movie, she was just very flat. Um... The woman who played her was gorgeous. I remember her being so beautiful. And I was obviously just watching the movie. She was gorgeous. Um, But she's very flat. Her tone of voice is very monotonous, emotionless, statuesque. I don't know if that was her trying to pretend to be smart. I don't know. But um, she's great in the book. And she's the kind of female character... I really, really like. She's got kind of like a femme fatale type uh, personality to her, and it's really charming. We miss Kind of breaks my heart. We're doing some detachment therapy. There's Felix in there freaking out without Wiley. Here's Wiley. I'm holding him. Yeah. So even if they're separated for just a couple moments, Felix gets really really anxious so we're trying to combat that with just a few minutes a day of wiley being on his own felix being on his own without wiley so yeah but about the book um we're at the part where they're gonna go see the mona lisa and to be quite honest i never really understood the deal with the mona lisa i don't think she's that pretty um her smile's kind of weird and evidently it's really really small it's like the size of an ipad so yeah mona lisa mona lisa's smile not that great 
page 200. And something that's really dating this is that uh, Sophie drives a smart car. <laughs> and this is back in like mid 2000s. Back in that day, which is when I was in, like, middle school, smart cars were kind of like the Teslas of those days. They were really, really, like, fuel efficient and kind of electric, but they were also, like, really, really small and just silly. Like, they looked like a little miniature ladybug almost. I'll insert a picture. But I feel like this could be really, really timeless if not for Sophie. Um, about one in the morning, and I can definitely see why the Catholic Church hated this. Listen to this. Aringa Rosa had never been comfortable with the Vatican's historical need to dabble in science. What was the rationale for fusing science and faith? Unbiased science could not possibly be performed by a man who possessed faith in God. I kind of agree with that, but nor did faith have any need for physical confirmation for its belief. So what a lot of people don't know is that the Vatican actually has a lot of scientists and they're not really terrible scientists. It's just that obviously they're starting with the conclusion first, which is kind of the antithesis of science and it's a contradiction and whether or not you want to reconcile it. Can we get to it? I don't know. But I'll bet you didn't know that the first person to ever theorize the Big Bang was a Catholic priest. So, um, yeah, the Vatican has actually done a lot of scientific, especially astronomy and uh, physical research. And actually, they claim to invent a time machine because if energy can never be created or destroyed, where does the energy go? And they claimed to have found a machine that could go back and photograph points in time and were actually allegedly able to photograph Christ being crucified but they destroyed the machine, worried that people were gonna use it for evil. And yet they're mad about the Da Vinci Code. Like this stuff is crazy, but it's true. The Da Vinci Code obviously isn't true, but what I just told you about the time machine, that is 100% true. I'm on page like 256, and I'm actually getting kind of tired. So I might go to bed <laughs> um, and just, I don't know, deal with the whole circadian rhythm being fucked up another time but i want to share with you from page 208 this paragraph lingdon was having trouble concentrating as a scattering of the parks nocturnal residents were already emerging from the shadows and flaunting their wares in the glare of the headlights it's quite a sentence ahead two topless teenagers shot smoldering gazes into the taxi Beyond them, a well-oiled black man in a G-string turned and flexed his buttocks. Beside him, a gorgeous blonde woman lifted her miniskirt to reveal that she was not, in fact, a woman. <laughs> Time. Ugh, nine o'clock at night and I'm finally in the spot where I can read. I've been busy all freaking day. Then I don't wake up until pretty late. So today is the day I'm gonna get my circadian rhythm back on track. I have a lot of crap to do in my house. It's a wreck. Um, and I'm gonna start some medication today, some weight loss medicine, which I'm pretty nervous about. Um, my whole life I've had trouble losing weight due to some other medication that I'm on, big hole spiel. But I'm gonna start reading. I'm gonna get my sleep back on track and uh, got some other stuff I'm gonna do, which you'll see later. Well, I just took my first dose of the weight loss meds and I feel literally nothing right now. Um, I didn't even feel the needle go in. That needle was tiny. I was pretty scared because um, he told me it was going to be in the form of a pen. I'll show you what my old um, migraine pen looked like. It hurt really bad. So I was like, oh God, if I don't have a migraine, it's probably going to hurt way worse. And Because, I mean, that thing hurt like hell. But getting rid of a migraine didn't really matter. So, um... Here's to hoping I lose some weight, and uh, let's read the Da Vinci Code. Page uh, 292, and we've just been introduced to the character played by Ian McKellen in the movie, and probably the most famous line Ian McKellen has ever said is this. Not pass! 
And so at the end of chapter 52, um, Sir Lee Teabing, who in the movie is played by Sir Ian McKellen, your heart is true, my friend, you may pass. So I wonder if that was like a tongue-in-cheek type thing. I gotta recall if it's in the movie, I don't know. I don't quite remember. Done a little bit more reading here, and we're getting into the very big... I'm not going to say anti-Christian, because it's not anti-Christian to criticize the Bible. It's just not. <laughs> um, to be rude to Christians because they're Christian, that's anti-Christian. So I'll read you this. Um, the Bible is a product of man, my dear. This is Gandalf speaking. Not of God. The Bible did not fall magically from the clouds. Man created it as a historical record of tumultuous times. And he says a little more. Jesus Christ was a historical figure of staggering influence. That's not true. Jesus was not, there was not a historical figure called Jesus. I don't feel like getting into that. It's really, really complicated. You can go view Holy Kool-Aid's video. He's actually one of my YouTube heroes. He's a fellow atheist, but um, yeah. So he's basically telling us, you know, Jesus was man. He wasn't divine. The Bible was created by men. Men created religion, which yes, that's true. But um, it's taking like perfect aim at the Catholic Church. A lot of the stuff the priests do in this is pretty bad. But let's just go ask those kids in Boston how bad the priests treated them. So I think there's a lot of rightful criticism in this book. Um, but this is the first part where I'm like, all right, you're presenting this as fact and this is not fact. So, yeah, I mean, Stan Brown, what do you expect? criticized aspects besides what it says about the Catholic Church in the Da Vinci Code is the way it presents sex. And I actually like it. I'm a very sex positive person. Um, <laughs> there we go. So Sophie witnessed her grandfather having sex and that's what they fell out about. Spoiler. But um, the way the sex is described is it's like men aren't fully holy until they combine with female because at the moment of male orgasm there's like a blankness the mind's fully blank that's when god can enter and yes i can see how that's deeply deeply offensive to pretty much all non-pagan religion <laughs> any monotheistic religion i can really really see how that would just infuriate them but i actually very like very much like this sentiment let's see if i can find it well yes in a matter speaking but not as we understand it today speaking of sex he explained that although what she saw probably looked like a sex ritual heros gamos don't speak french so sorry which is the ritual she witnessed, had nothing to do with eroticism. It was a spiritual act. Historically, intercourse was the act in which male and female experienced God. <laughs> with a capital G. The ancients believed that the male was spiritually incomplete until he had carnal knowledge of the sacred feminine. Physical union with the female remained the sole means through which man could become spiritually complete and ultimately achieve gnosis knowledge of the divine by communing with women langdon said man could achieve a climactic instant when his mind went totally blank and he could see god sophie looked skeptical orgasm is prayer langdon gave a non-committal shrug so i really like the emotion and spirituality around sex um i don't think we should worship anything because i think worship is a waste of time but uh, sex is not a waste of time, so good for you. Approaching 4 a.m. here in the, in the, I don't know, loft of the country apartment, we'll call it. And I've got Wiley here for his, uh, his detachment therapy. So um, 
our boy Felix is alone and I'm covered in shavings because Wiley's long haired so he carries some stuff with him but um yeah I'm almost done I'm on page 520 out of like 597 or something and there's a lot that happens especially towards this part of the book that does not happen in the movie and there's actually more characters than appear in the movie and um yeah, so I think the movie was a terrible adaptation. It's not just a bad story. So from what I'm finding of this book, Dan Brown can tell a great story, but he can't write. And there's a difference. It's 27 a.m. and I'm done. I finished The Da Vinci Code. And it's funny, this book takes place within like 48 hours. <laughs> And that's pretty much what it took me to read it. I mean, obviously I had stuff to do today. Um, and I didn't start reading till like 5 p.m. yesterday or the day before. I don't know. <laughs> it's 5.30 January 7th. I started reading it at like 5 p.m. January 5th. Um, and I think if we add up all those hours, it kind of adds to like probably nine, maybe about nine hours I spent actually reading this. Um, Final verdict, star rating, three and a half. As I said earlier, Dan Brown can tell a wonderful story, but he can't write. They're very different, um, very different skills. Writing's a skill. Writing is a skill. And storytelling is a skill. They're different. When you put them together, you get greatness. You get great books. You get, I don't know what to compare them what would be the like a great version of the da vinci code but when you pair good writing with good storytelling you get george rr R. martin you get james joyce my pigs are squeaking you get greatness um was this greatness no <laughs> this was pulp this was man porn like you know women i guess this this was very manly guys <laughs> um, um it would describe like all the engines and all the cool cars and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, just, just get to it. I don't care what car they're driving. Um, and one of the more annoying things about this is every time a character is introduced, they will describe like exactly what that character is wearing, exactly what they look like. Like there are graceful, more finessed ways to do that, that come with honing your writing skill. Um, so three and a half stars. Why this pissed so many people off is, um, comes down to this. This is something the book does, and this is something that religion does, is that it mistakes symbols for artifacts, and artifacts can be used as evidence. Symbols aren't evidence in themselves. Um, so... That, I think, is why, I mean, it just challenges everything people do believe. And it's in the book. It says, you know, what if people find out the greatest story ever told is actually a lie? Personally, I think it is and always has been. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I teach research at school. So finding evidence is very, very important. And in this book, all the symbols they interpret and all that crap, that leads them to artifacts. So that's where these conspiracy theorists kind of go crazy. They get this symbology in certain things. They think it means something else. They think it proves their point. Like, oh, look, this is a blade and chalice. This proves, this symbol proves it doesn't. So Dan Brown's writing sucks. And the ending to this is very, very different than the ending in the movie. And I was left actually wanting more. I want to know more about Sophie. I think if Sophie's performance in the movie, the woman who played her, <laughs> I think if she had a little more life to her, that the movie would have been vastly different. Yes, it makes critical changes to certain plot elements that don't work, especially towards the end. Um, Sophie was very much more a damsel in distress in the movie than she was kind of the femme fatale she is here. I mean, 
Langdon, Robert Langdon, the main character, I think in every book he has a different woman. So it's like, you know, we have Bond girls, he's got like Langdon girls. Um, but it turns out there's an extended version of the movie, which I'll probably watch like right now. But um, yeah, three and a half stars. I hear there's a young adult version of this book, which I want to get for my classroom, because this is something my kids would read. It's definitely way over their head. Um, an average 14, 15, 16 year old could totally read this, but my kids like on a good day read on a sixth, seventh grade level. So if that, I mean, I have some, I mean, I have some kids who literally cannot read. So, um, but yeah, so I'm obviously very tired right now. Um, but trying to put all my thoughts together, I just want more about Sophie. I want Dan Brown to write a spinoff, just focusing on Sophie. She was the most interesting part of this book. She was spunky. She was funny. She was evidently, I mean, beautiful. She was described as beautiful in here. And she was way, way smarter than Langdon. And that's not how it was in the movie. She relied on Robert Langdon to solve things for her. And in this book, she solves more than Langdon does. Langdon even admits that she is smarter than him. And she is. So there I'm not gonna spoil the end, but I want to spin off about Sophie, her family, and what happens with her after the Da Vinci Code. They're very horny at the end. They're kissing and making out and planning to spend time um in somewhere like they're horny at the end. They get together in the end. I don't think that's that big of a spoiler because it's pretty obvious. But yes, they sort of get together in the end and they're very horny. And that's where we leave Sophie and Langdon. There's no overt sex in this book, but the writing does remind me a little bit of Ken Follett and that he, Dan Brown, lays everything out to you. Like he has to tell you the history of every place, of every person, of everything that they're going. Like he just assumes that the readers are not going to know this stuff. Which, when you go in and you have as much education as I do, then it's a little bit annoying. But I think, like, this book is not meant for the ultra smart person. This is perfectly passable commercial literature. You go, you see this at an airport or something, an airport bookstore. You got a four hour flight to Puerto Rico. Oh, look, it's a Da Vinci Code. I've heard of that. You grab it for five bucks, you sit on the plane, maybe you get hooked, maybe you don't. But the way it leaves off with such these short chapters and they all end on big cliffhangers, it just sucks you in. Is like, can I say that this book is bad? The book is not bad. The writing is bad. But I definitely don't think that this would be published in today's publishing climate because it's so hard to get published now. Um, so if you are an aspiring writer, don't copy this because you're not going to make it. So that's it for me, guys.